Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. The humble hard drive. You've seen them, you probably take them for granted. This is a modern two terabyte, three and a half inch hard drive that you'd get in a typical desktop computer. And they're available in pretty small sizes these days, especially for their size, incredible. These can go up to four terabyte in three and a half inch size. This is the smallest uh, current form factor you can buy, the one point eight inch and they're available in up to 300 odd gigabytes in these sizes but that wasn't always the case these things have had an amazing evolution back from the mid 50s when they were developed by IBM and well I can remember buying my first uh, hard drive uh, mid 80s or thereabouts 20 megabytes that's not 20 gigabytes it's 20 megabytes let alone terabytes that you can get in these things Incredible, cost me about 300 bucks or thereabouts. Nowadays you can get, like what, a terabyte for under 100 bucks? You're kidding me. <sighs> so these are fascinating technology. There's uh, developed in density by orders, many orders of magnitude over many decades, not to mention reducing in cost as well. So I thought we'd crack one open, have a look at the technology inside, but not one of these weird ass modern ones, no thought would go a bit retro. Late 70s, early 80s. Great period. Let me get it for you. Hang on, this could take a bit. <sighs> Let me move the uh, chair out of the way. This is a real hard drive, folks. The mother of all hard drives. Let's check it out. Here we go. Hang on. <clears throat> Bend the legs. Ta-da! This is a hard drive. <laughs> it's an IBM hard drive, late 70s, early 80s, not sure of the exact year, whopping 10 megabytes. And yes, it weighs 38 and a half kilos or about 85 pounds. It's an absolute monster. We're gonna tear this sucker down and uh, don't worry about me dropping it. No worries, we're in Australian safety boots. Beauty, let's go. And if you're wondering what this thing was worth back in late 70s, early 80s, about a quarter of a million bucks. Beauty. And yes, folks, I wasn't kidding. This sucker is really worth a quarter of a million dollars, or it was worth a quarter of a million dollars back in late 70s, early 80s. And uh, this particular unit um, was used well into the uh, 80s because they didn't want to write off the cost of these things. They were cost so much money to uh, install, service and maintain, even though hard drives were dropping, uh, even big server ones like this, dropping by orders of magnitude, they didn't want to write off that co cost very quickly. So <laughs> it was still used for quite some time. And this particular one is actually from a bank. It's from the ANZ Bank here in Australia, and it was used to presumably um, store, store all of the banking records. And no, it has been securely wiped, so no one's uh, credit card numbers are on here. Not that we, did we have credit cards back in the 80s? Maybe bank card, hmm. Anyway, this is an IBM, ah, let's have a look. It's an, got the original sticker on it here. IBM, there it is, IBM, Asterix 397X, so I assume it's like a, I don't know, a 397X series or something, or 397X series, something like that. I'm not sure, um, haven't been able to find much uh, info on it, so if people have any information on that, please let me know. And check out this funky little temperature dial here. They've actually got, it is about halfway, it is around about 23, 24 degrees here in the lab. And this is completely passive, now this thing is an absolute beast. It, it's actually designed um, on a sliding chassis, hence the handle here. It's got the big carry handle and handle on the other side. So this chunk of metal on the back here is actually a sliding frame designed to slide into a rack there. And uh, we can already see some of the stuff. Perhaps we've got some uh, cable in with some beauty connectors on here. Absolute uh, classics, look at that. And uh, yeah, so this thing was designed to slide in with the aid of a tool. You can't have, you know, even back then they still had OH&S and you couldn't have people lifting up uh, near 40 
uh, kilo or 90 pound uh, units and you know shoving them into racks so they had some sort of tool to help lift them up and put them into the rack and you can see that they had uh, shock and vibration mounts as well you can actually see the compliance in that one if I give it a bit of a wobble you can see the compliance in the rubber there that would uh, dampen shock and vibration from the uh, both from the uh, rack and into the hard drive and uh, also outwards and you know that would be uh, very cleverly designed so that it does it avoids any resonant modes during operation and all sorts of stuff and these would be ultra reliable uh, hard drives so you know these are in banks storing data this is serious and this is why these suckers cost back in those days a quarter of a million dollars each do you believe it and you may have noticed on the unit this little port here they've actually got one here and one on the other side of the unit what was this for it's actually for pressurized halon gas uh, which is actually quite a dangerous gas to be pumped into these hard drives so they operate under that halon gas and it's actually a fire suppressant now this halon gas wasn't just used in the hard drive itself to save the data and uh, there's the other port over on that side there so they would uh, pump pressurized halon gas into this thing but the entire rooms that these things were housed in the computer server rooms uh, had halon gas as well uh, not during operation but if there was any fire then they would uh, a big alarm bell would ring off and you've got like a minute to get out of there or put on your gas mask otherwise <laughs> you would you know you would die because they would fill the room with this halon gas fire suppressant they were really serious about protecting the data in these hard drives and on the back of the unit here where it uh, slid in it would uh, slide in forward like this presumably there would be the mating uh, multi-pin uh, bus connector under there like that it would mate with uh, power and something else here I'm not sure what and uh, that would be how it slots into the rack so this would be the end that goes into the rack and the uh, handle would be on the other end and on the front of the unit here they've got like another port maybe that's a uh, some sort of test port I don't know um, as in like a test like a gas uh, porter it might be a uh, pressure valve or something like that I'm not exactly sure what and uh, we've got some power coming around to this side as well maybe going into the uh, spindle motor or something because we've got some heavy duty cabling going on in here so anyway we'll find that out when we crack this sucker open and here we go let's take it open now I think we've got one big uh, sort of you know die cast um, slash machined um, top on the thing so I think if we undo these uh, hex screws around here we should just be able to lift up this top part at least for starters and uh, see the good stuff the pornographic stuff which is the platens so let's uh, crack this thing open see what we get ha oh, here we go folks this is going to be exciting I think it seems to be lifting off here we go let me see I don't want it to come crashing down ta-da oh, oh look at the porn in there and check this out what a Bobby Dazzler fair dinkum oh, it's an absolute cracker this one look at the uh, we've got two four six eight nine platters in here single-sided uh, head so they'd be doing you know uh, just over one uh, meg per plate unbelievable and if we get in there with the measuring tape we're looking at 11 inch or thereabouts you're working the old money with these uh, hard drives 11 inch platters in there beautiful so this is what a quarter of a million bucks would buy you in super reliable server storage technology in the late 70s early 80s and uh, if you compare and contrast that with you may have noticed it sitting here a modern well modern these came out in 19 uh, mid 90s so really only you know a 10 15 years uh, difference kind of thing between this thing which is a 10 megabytes to 
a couple of hundred gig, uh, this was later on, but you know, we're talking four orders of magnitude. Look at it, unbelievable. But if you break these things down, you'll find that they're still essentially working identically. Yeah, the encoding format and the densities and the data rates have all uh, changed. I mean, the data rates inside modern hard drives are absolutely incredible, the serial data rates in and out of the heads and all the physics with the magnetics has all uh, changed, but they're essentially the operation is still the same. We've got the platters um, coded with the magnetic material, we've got the uh, spindle, we've got the actuators, we've got the heads, we've got the uh, head, there's probably a head uh, preamplifier on there, and uh, you know, and the decoding electronics, they're all going to essentially be identical to modern hard drives. And look at the solid uh, machined chassis on these things, absolutely incredible. And if you check out inside the head unit itself, fully O-ring uh, sealed of course, but you'll notice they've also got air filters in there either side. So that air filter down in there would be uh, filtering the halon, pressurized halon gas which goes into this thing. Now on the bottom here it looks like we're going to have our spindle motor down in here, that'd be this uh, cover plate down in there. If we take that off we might be able to uh, look at the spindle motor under there. It looks like a huge monster and we've this is uh, almost certainly our actuator motor down here. Now I'm not actually sure how much electronics we're going to find in this thing. I mean we'll have our um, amplifier uh, head on the top here on the uh, actuator arm itself. Looks like these are just sort of looks like some sort of interconnect system. I'll try and get those out later and uh, flat flex uh, ribbon cable coming over and um, it certainly doesn't have the processing in it like uh, modern hard drives do today, that's for sure. Here you go, that wasn't hard at all. Watch this, the snap that open, look at that. All the, that customized connector solution that, you know, it, like you won't find, uh, you know, solution like that off the shelf. It's just it's totally customized for this particular unit. No wonder they had to you know, charge in a quarter of a million bucks a pop. They had to amortize all the R&D cost of this thing. And it looks like all the data for our heads uh, pops out along all these traces. There's a lot of traces down in there and it pops down into, um, it looks like probably, uh, I don't know if there's any electronics under that, but probably down to that main header connector we saw down there. And these flat flexes here, they just pop off here and then going into these two traces down the bottom there, which probably go down to uh, the main interconnect connector down on the back there, presumably. And check it out folks, I found a genuine hardware bug in this thing. Right inside the channel there, maybe during servicing. And down on the bottom of the unit here you can see this custom plastic a flat flex connector sort of embedded in uh, some plastic like this, that that big huge uh, couple of hundred pin bus connector uh, joins onto. So that actually does, it looks like, goes straight down to there and then straight onto this paneling down in here. There you go, it goes straight down into there, straight into these connectors and then straight over into the uh, heads there. So um, yeah, this thing, you know, it, it doesn't look like it contains any processing electronics uh, at all, apart from the um, apart from the uh, ASIC. Presumably, that would be on the uh, head driver in there, the head uh, amplifier slash buffer. That'd be about it. Well, check this out, folks. Look at that date code: February eighteenth, nineteen ninety-one. So I don't know if it was manufactured in ninety-one or whether or not they retrofitted a new cable to this thing in ninety-one, but. There you go, that's fascinating that they were still manufacturing, the, if they were, if it is 91, they were still manufacturing these 10 megabyte hard drives right up until that time. And it turns out this temperature strip on the back here, which does actually uh, work by the way, I've had it uh, go up and down in temperature, is just a peel off tape like that, that they stick on it. It's, there's no mechanism at all inside that. Look at that, it's gone up to 28 now, so it claims. 30, there we go, slowly going up, 32, as I touch this thing, it goes up in temperature, neat. 
And if we take the cover plate off the spindle motor here, it looks like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a nine pole, three phase induction motor because uh, there seems to be three phases there. There we go, we've got three main uh, windings. We've got black, red, and white there with the big thick cables like that. There's a green earth wire, presumably, and a couple of other signal wires as well. So there you go, that's a bit of a beast. I'm not sure how much uh, mass it actually has to uh, rotate and at what uh, speed, what operational speed this thing would have uh, worked at, but that's a pretty funky looking unit. I like it. And once again, we seem to have that date code, ninth week, 91. So. I think this sucker was actually manufactured in 1991. But hey, IBM would have had uh, this, you know, big, you know, decade long or decades long service contracts for these things. And they didn't want to rock the boat. They just wanted to replace them with uh, exactly what they got. So it looks like they were still manufacturing these in 1991. Go figure. But you know, I guess if they, you know, did the contract and manufactured, first uh, designed and manufactured these back in the early 80s or late 70s, you know, it's not much more than a decade uh, service life, which for this kind of industry is uh, not that uncommon at all. And on this interface board here, you can clearly see what's uh, likely a positional uh, sensor, probably some sort of a uh, hall sensor or something like that. So they've got one there, one there and one there. And I just love looking inside these platens. Look at that. Ah, it's a thing of beauty. Joy forever. You can see in here part of the rubber seal as well, which actually goes all the way down the side there, right down here and over and around that into a... Uh, uh, machined groove in the chassis like that. So that seals this, uh, you know, the air of this section because uh, the filter is just in between here. So the filter, the uh, air comes in here and then has to go through the filter to get to the rest of it. Now check out the really cool linear slides on here. Look, we've got them machined into these blocks here and you can see the rollers inside there. So obviously this um, head which uh, likely contains like a uh, four or five heads on it is designed to slide out of this somehow but uh, haven't quite figured it out yet I've taken some screws off here but it's um it's really quite a complex uh, block overall this whole head system it really is quite amazing so I'm still trying to figure out how to slide this damn thing out and if we take off this black cover here there's actually a grub screw in the back of this which uh, then goes onto this spring and pushes that in and you can see the uh, linear slide in there moving back and forth now I can't pull that out but uh, what that does is that um, adjusts the head here so you'll be able to, as I move that you'll be able to see the head just move it tweaking back and forth like that all right I figured out how to get this whole module out and with hindsight it was obvious you had to take out the uh, actuator motor from the bottom first because that shaft was holding the whole thing in through that little hole down in there like that so there it is there so once you get that out from the bottom you can lift out carefully <laughs> You don't scratch the discs. I'm sure there's a better way to do it, but ta-da, we have the entire head assembly. Now these things, of course, would be designed to be very serviceable. I mean, you aren't going to just uh, throw out, you know, if it fails, you're not gonna throw out one of these huge uh, machined die-cast um, chassis or anything like that, massively expensive. I mean, you know, this thing costs a quarter of a million dollars. You're gonna service the thing. So everything is designed with servicing in mind. If the, you know, if you need to replace the platters, you're gonna replace the platters. If you need to replace the heads, you're gonna replace those, any of the, uh, you know, well, there's not much else in it uh, that can fail really, because this is essentially just a uh, spindle motor with a platen, an actuator, and some heads, and uh, that's pretty much it. It's uh, just raw data out. But yeah, these things, um, 
these are not today's consumer throwaway items. And you can see why they've gone for this uh, flex PCB sort of embedded in this plastic membrane here. It's to get uh, a good uh, sealing around here. You can see it all gunked up right around the bottom around there and that's you know complete airtight seal so that's how they uh, penetrate this thing and also right around inside there as well so that's how they um, penetrate the main chassis down here while keeping an airtight seal with you know how many you know 32 heads or whatever having to go through and penetrate and get all the data out of this thing so that's how they decide to do it and it's a, never really seen um, anything like that before. It's a quite remarkable construction technique. And here's where all the precision engineering comes in with the head. Even though the tolerances on this hard drive are huge compared to today's standards, you can see the heads uh, are able to move very smoothly. Trust me, that is pornographically smooth um, on those linear bearings in there. Absolutely beautiful. And we've got a total of uh, 32 heads. I thought this was um, single-sided. I was told it was a single-sided uh, platen, but it's not because if you get in here, you can see there is uh, 32 heads total. There's actually a head back here and there's a head up here. I'll show you these in de more detail in a second, but you can see that that little flex arm there and the one on the top the heads are a bit out of whack because they're designed to free float and i'll show you that closer in a sec but there you go that one does the upper side of that top plate this one does the underside of the top plate so the top surface of the top plate is not uh, used but we've got 16 heads down there and we've got another 16 heads back here so with hard drives, a lot of the access time is going to be taken up with the physical movement of the actuator arm back and forth like that, or swept across the disk. In modern hard drives, you've seen them you know, sweep back and forth <laughs> really, really quick. Well, this would do the same thing. It would move in and out, in and out really very quickly, but it takes time to get to the position, settle down before it can read or write the data. So the... the uh, less uh, distance you have to move like that, the greater your capable, your data rate is going to be. And if you've got dual heads, well, you can write twice as much information while moving half the distance. We have a look at these heads in a bit more detail. You can see the armature there. There's really slight pressure. You can see the spring bar in there designed to just put the required amount of pressure onto the head. And in this example here, you can see that the uh, ladder would sit in between the two like that and then they would rest on the surface and you'll notice that they're really very compliant and designed to sit very flat on that surface with very minimal amount of pressure. You can probably see one of the little wires on the back side there for the head. And when I said single wire, well it's actually a dual pair. Look at that. You can see the red and the green in there, hopefully. You can see the arm moving up and down, and that's actually a twisted pair going over and soldered onto the flat flex membrane over there, and very nicely clamped in there. It's got some uh, tubing over it so you don't actually uh, short or pinch out the wires there. Really beautiful construction, and these would all be, uh, you know, hand assembled and somebody's tweaked it with their tongue at the right angle. Ah, oh, beautiful. You might be able to see it a bit clearer there. They've put some tape over the top of that just to uh, anchor the uh, wires in place just to take the stress out of those before they're soldered because you don't want any uh, flexion on that or any vibration uh, ruining that solder joint there and getting fatigue on that. So they're de-stressing that with some tape there. really is um, beautiful, fine construction technique. I really like it. Imagine what today's modern hard drives are like. Oh, don't even ask. And if you have a close-up of the head there, you can see that, if I can get the pointer in here, you can see that uh, the where the two wires were soldered onto, I've actually broken that one off, and uh, that goes into a coil down in there, and it looks like there's a second identical coil on this side, but it's not actually connected there. So if we flip it, up like that you can see oh look at that we've got an individual serial number on there 
individually serial numbered isn't that sexy. Oh, I love it. And uh, the backside, of course, is nothing uh, special, but that would be a um, rather obscure material uh, ferrite head. Now you'll notice that the head here is not completely flat. It contains these skids either side of it here. And there's two reasons for this. It um, raises the uh, ferrite and head uh, above the surface of the disc by a fixed amount. But the first reason is that it reduces the uh, friction, of course, because the less surface area, the less friction you're gonna have. But the second reason they do it is that it forms a little aerodynamic pocket inside there, which helps stabilize and level the head when it's flying over the surface. And that can be very important for repeatability. And that's why the head uh, floats on those little armatures you've seen in there, because it's essentially a self-leveling device. It's not just in a fixed position. It just, you know, uh, floats just above the surface there under aerodynamic pressure. Really neat design. Now, a lot of the early magnetic uh, alloy materials used in these heads are things you've probably never heard of, like uh, moly denim perm alloy, things like send dust and alphanol, go figure. But um, then they moved on to uh, some more uh, amorphous ferromagnetic alloys and pretty much um, ferrites dominate the industry these days for heads, even around uh, this, area. So, this era. So this is probably some form of uh, ferrite material. And these new ferrite materials are usually either like a nickel zinc or a magnesium zinc type uh, combination alloy, but they're certainly not just your regular uh, ferrites you'll find in your uh, inductors and stuff like that. These are pretty, you know, obscure um, materials, uh, you know, uh, alloy materials used for very specific properties and all has to do with the uh, width and the density and the hardness and all sorts of things that you're trying to get in modern hard drive, it, the modern ones these days, oh, who knows what they're doing, doing. It's rocket science. Now these heads have to have near zero magnetostriction, it's called, which basically uh, means that this thing can change shape based on the applied magnetic field very slightly, but because this is a highly precision engineered head, even back then, I mean the modern ones today, <laughs> order of magnitude more uh, sensitive, of course, but. Uh, even back then, you have to be very careful that this thing, when you're writing the ones and zeros to it, changing the magnetic field, that it does not physically change shape. And that can work uh, vice versa as well. So any uh, strain on this thing can actually uh, generate a magnetic field. So they can be used as a sensor in that respect. So you don't want any of those type of effects in a magnetic recording head. So these materials will be chosen to have near zero magnetostriction effect. Now these heads actually have to perform three functions on these hard drives because they've only got the one head. So they have to do both read, write, and also erase as well. And uh, a basic, a very crude uh, inductive uh, ferrite head like this will have a ferrite material with the gap in there. The gap is uh, the part that uh, sits over the track and does the recording. And we've got you know a couple of uh, turns of uh, coil in there and that generates a three-dimensional, that's important, a three-dimensional magnetic field in here with uh, primarily as much coming out the Y direction onto the platter because if the platter's, you know, if this thing's flat against your platter like that, then you want it to go out there and you don't want much in the X direction here because that's uh, their fringing effects which then can, you know, if your track width is in there like that, you don't want any fringing effects to affect other tracks, I mean, they're, they're not physical bumps like that. I'm, you know, I'm just drawing the, uh, the magnetic tracks in the platter like that. You don't want any fringing effects coming out the uh, X direction here and causing problems with adjacent tracks that you've just written. You know, if you're writing data to here, you don't want to accidentally write another bit into a track that you've just, an adjacent track you've just written data to. So these are very complex and solving the three-dimensional magnetic field equations, there's their integrals over space, and they, ah, oh, there's all sorts of complex stuff that uh, basically, you know, you can't uh, solve them because um, they're finite distance, they're not like an infinite space and stuff like that. Very difficult, very complex uh, mathematical and three-dimensional field 
uh, magnetic field solving stuff, and you could do an entire PhD thesis on just magnetic heads. I'm sure many people have. And the same thing goes with the Z direction here. I mean, this platter might be, you know, spinning around in that direction. So, you know, you've got your track on your hard drive there. So your stepper motors come in here for your head and it's right into this track here. And this disc is spinning in this direction. You need to write each bit and you don't want fringing effects in the Z direction either because that can interfere with the last bit you just wrote on that uh, you know, rotating magnetic disc. And there's lots of complex interactions with the, uh, you know, the width of the gap and the distance between the gap and the platter and the type of uh, material on the platter and the magnetic fields and uh, all sorts of stuff, whether or not the cores are laminated and, ah, oh, man, you could analyze these until the cows come home. Now, one of the issues with these uh, heads, especially across uh, these sort of distances, is what's called thermal track shift. And that basically um, means, well, as it implies, there's a thermal shift. When these things heat up, these heads can physically expand just minute, amount, minute amounts, and then it changes, uh, it affects the position of the head relative to where it's supposed to be on the track. So, you know, as these things warm up, you get uh, expansion out of these arms and that can uh, cause issues with track al alignment or track misalignment. So uh, you can also get changes in ambient temperature causing the same thing. And that can be a big deal, even at these sort of densities. And we'll take a quick peek inside the actuator motor here and uh, let's have a look. There's the uh, model number for those playing along at home. And let's pop this away. We've got a bit of spring movement there. There we go. Check that out. Isn't that beautiful? And there's our motor down there. We've got another couple of cogs in there and looks like we've got a uh, device uh, acting as a heatsink in there. I'm not sure what that sucker's doing at all. So it looks like we've got a, some sort of a spring return uh, gear reduction mechanism here. The motor drives this reduction gear system, which then winds up that spring and there's a lot of, I mean, I can't manually move that. There's a hu huge amount of torque required to uh, move that sucker. It's a traditional linear actuator motor controlled by these two <laughs> strips over here. Doll, oh, there you go. And what this is, is this is a uh, lock mechanism to lock the heads. It, it actually goes in here like this. So it comes in here and I can turn that and boom, I can pull and lock those heads back into position like that. So that locks both sets of heads and once it's released, it's only like a half turn, like a quarter turn or something like that. So it's, you know, so that's why this thing has that spring return mechanism. It just, I guess if there's, you know, power fails or something, then it automatically, bang, locks the heads back into position like that. Ah, really obvious. So what we've got is we've got like a voice coil in here, it's like it very much like a speaker, exactly how a speaker works. But instead of moving a cone, we're using moving four actuator arms, and they're separate banks like that of four arms, so they can move independently with these two voice coils. Let's check out the voice coil resistance here. If we can get in there, ta da! Your traditional eight ohms. Hmm, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Absolutely. But of course, this sort of linear actuator is not going to have the same sort of uh, bandwidth as a traditional loudspeaker, purely because we've got a lot more mass in this actuator arm uh, mechanism here than you do in like a paper cone on your traditional loudspeaker. So this thing's probably only going to have a bandwidth of, you know, maybe a kilohertz or two at most, just enough to get the access time required for the head. So we can just easily drive our linear actuator with our function generator here. Now put in a sine wave at uh, 10 hertz and ta-da, there it goes. Works just like a loudspeaker. If I take it right down to one volt, for example, we're getting a tiny little bit of movement there, if you can see that. And if I up that, five volts, 10 volts, maximum of 20 volts on this function gen. There we go. And of course we can adjust the frequency. That's 10 hertz at the moment. So let me uh, 
adjust that down. <laughs> One hertz. Boom, 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 boom. Fantastic. And if we do a one hertz triangle wave there, you can see the, uh, the more linear motion of it because of the ramp instead of the sine wave. That's a one hertz sine wave. And you can see the difference in the ramp. And if we do a one hertz square wave, it's gonna go bang, bang. Bang, 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 bang. And although we're not gonna be able to see higher frequencies, we'll certainly be able to hear them. Here we go, I'll put the mic up to it. And you'll be able to hear, that's one kilohertz. And then two. Hey. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kilohertz. Woohoo! And you probably can't hear that now, that's 15 kilohertz. So there you go, beauty. I think I'm finally able to get this bastard out of here. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh man, I've been struggling with that locking bar for ages. Mongrel, precision engineering my ass. Anyway, check it out. We can now, should be able to lift out the entire module. Beauty. So each one of these linear actuators weighs almost 3.4 kilos on its own. That's for uh, four actuator arms and 16 heads. Unbelievable, man. But these are all solid machined um, uh, linear guides on these things. Absolutely incredible. Now I've taken the screws on this thing off, but I can't seem to get the uh, two halves open. I think they've been pressed in there. You can see the uh, you can see those uh, press fit studs in there. It looks like they've been actually, you know, hammered together and squeeze fitted in there. So I might have to try and pry it open. It's uh, because it, you can kind of just see the uh, where you, you can kind of see the coil in here somewhere. There it is, down in there. You can see that. We can actually see that coil inside there going over that central bar. Take a look at that. Nice. So um, I don't think we're actually going to be able to see anything else by taking this thing apart. Um, and I can't, I've got the hammer out and used a bit of percussive maintenance, but I cannot force this thing open. So I might uh, leave it as is, but there's nothing more interesting in there than just that uh, coil going over the uh, central magnet in there, that'd be, that'd be basically it. And we've got those uh, linear bearings, look at those. They're just pornographic, really. Oh, ever seen a speaker that good? I've taken off one of the heads here, it's still connected via the flat flex here, there's no way to avoid that. You can see a custom IBM uh, can under there that no doubt contains the uh, head preamp and uh, is soldered directly onto the flat flex there, which of course goes over to the main connector that we've seen before. So I uh, might see if I can pop that can over, open, and uh, see what we can find. I mean, we've got uh, four pairs going into this thing from the four heads, and then we've got the pairs going out, and that just carries the raw uh, head data back to the main header connector into, as we saw right at the start of the video, into uh, the uh, big rack connector system. So, geez, you know, it's basically just a raw data output hard drive. Now, please excuse these uh, heads. I've got them falling off all over the place and missing. They're very delicate, but look at this. Here's this uh, interlock bar in here. Here it is right here. And if I pull that back, you can see the heads pinched together like that. So that's part of that uh, lock-in protection uh, bar that was the pain in the ass to get out. It's just a motor to uh, pull the heads back, lock them in place and shut them down. These spring head mechanisms, they're really very delicate little beasts. They would have been carefully designed to apply just the right amount of pressure, you know, and they would have thoroughly tested them. Really tweaked and uh, highly engineered part of hard drive design is just getting the correct pressure there on the heads. I was able to pull the head module 
out of the flat flex there and ah, look at that looks like it is fully potted bummer but of course that could just be the bottom of it so we should be able to get in there and uh, maybe hey probably open this I sense a ceramic hybrid coming on well there you go that was hardly worth popping off at all ah oh, just a bare die mounted on a ceramic uh, substrate there with a couple of like 0603 caps ah oh. anyway that would no doubt be a custom uh, IBM ASIC does all the head driver functionality record read erase the whole works now, as for these platters, these are very carefully uh, machined aluminium discs and the material on there is like a cobalt uh, based alloy usually and that will be sputtered on there in a vacuum deposition process and you can see that uh, some of it's all just spilled on the edges of the disc there which doesn't matter a rat's ass really. It's all about the uh, conformity and the thickness of the coating. Now, of course, I was going to try and get these uh, platters out, but I just cannot get my uh, shifter on the top of that, my shifting spanner on there to open it up. I'm going to need some uh, more heavy-duty uh, tools I don't have here in the lab. That one's done up good and tight, unfortunately, but there you have it. Um, that's pretty much all there is to this uh, classic IBM hard drive. And uh, as I said before, if you do have more details on this particular uh, model, we would uh, love to hear about it. So please uh, leave it in the comments or uh, go to the EEV blog forum, which is where all the action's gonna happen on the talk of this sucker. So the technology in this thing is uh, pretty basic as far as modern hard drives go, but it is incredibly machined. These linear actuators, fantastic, just love it. Brilliant stuff. And uh, the magnetic uh, density on these platters, using the 11 inch platters, in this thing is absolutely nothing compared to modern hard drives and as you saw there's no controller in this thing at all the controller would be in the uh, rack uh, hard drive system because all we've got are these little uh, preamp head preamps in there which we saw and that's basically it it's just uh, pre amplifying the signal and then driving it along right into the uh, back plane bus and well, that's going to be one hell of a controller when it's got to control all these hard drives with all that raw data coming in. But uh, this thing's only 10 megabytes, not huge data rate. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. That is the most expensive teardown to date. It's worth a quarter of a million dollars. Do you believe it? But hey, we're talking about banks here. Catch you next time. Of course, no teardowns complete without sacrificing some blood to the teardown gods.